Hello and welcome to this very special encore of my 27th episode that I released back in August of 2021. Back then, I had a great conversation with my guest, Jim Cooper, where among other topics, we chatted about the book he was penning, now known as the not-so-little book about cancer caregiving, Be a Caregiver Warrior and Keep Your Sanity which is part memoir and caregiving advice that was birthed from his time as a caregiver to his wife during her battle with brain cancer. Jim's book was just released in paperback and is now available on Amazon. I think it's important to note that I have no affiliate relationship with Amazon. Rather, I'm supporting the tremendous act of service that Jim is providing via the release of his book. As someone who was a caregiver myself to several family members who were battling their own cancer, I know this will be an extremely welcome resource to those folks who suddenly find themselves in a caregiving position. I hope you're having a wonderful summer and enjoy this encore presentation with my guest, Jim Cooper. But, you know, seeing their sense of play and optimism and joy in the midst of a lot of the chaos that their lives have gone through personally, as well as, you know, all the other global chaos that's going on with, you know, the pandemic and, yeah you know, wars and everything else. You know, I, I look at them and in one breath, I get angry that we're giving them this world that we're giving them. On the other hand, I look at them and say, you know what, you guys may come up with a solution that, you know, my generation, you know, didn't come up with. And, you know, maybe there's there's hope in that going down the road. Disinformation is spreading. There will be a we surprise so outbreak. Is the issue of pandemic. No social distancing at all. They said that they would express their concerns um, about the mask quickly. supply. Where's the mask? Where's the glove? A second wave is we all need some all good news. People. A message for all the healthcare workers out there. Thank you. From Santa Rosa, California, this is 19 Stories. I'm Cheryl Holland. My next guest is a veteran radio personality, voice actor, author, book publisher, and drummer. He cut his on-air personality at KILT in Houston, on-air talent production and music manager at WMLP and WOEZ-FM in Pennsylvania. In central New Jersey, he hosted, wrote, and produced a syndicated film review radio program called All That Glitters that aired on WCTC and WMGQ. These days, his voiceover credentials run the gamut from audiobooks, e-learning modules, corporate explainer videos, radio promos, and phone messaging systems. He's also the creator, producer, and host of The Hydrant, an inside-the-actor's studio-ish video chat with the movers and shakers of the voiceover industry. I'd like to welcome the VO Big Dog, a.k.a. Jim Cooper, to 19 Stories. Thank you. It is a pleasure and an honor to be here. It is certainly a pleasure to have you here, Jim, and thank you for taking the time to talk with me. How are you doing today? Doing okay today. I'm in the middle of a fairly long and intense audiobook narration, so this is kind of a nice break in the day. I definitely want to talk to you about your audiobooks and all the aforementioned goodies that you're involved in. I'd love to know whereabouts in the country you're joining me from. I'm in Delaware. What are your current COVID mandates, if any, and Uh, how are you holding up? You know, it's it's so funny because when I started doing voiceover, it was a couple years ago, and it's like all of a sudden COVID hit and everyone has to quarantine. Well, I feel like I've been quarantining for three years already anyway, so this is no different for me. (laughs) Um, So, you know, I, I go with the flow. I mean, if we go out, I'll put a mask on. I couldn't even tell you what the mandates are because I really don't pay too much attention to it. It's basically how I'm feeling about what's going on. And, you know, right now, yeah, we're spiking back up and here we go again. So I'm going to be a little bit more cautious now. The VO Big Dog. How did you come (laughs) to have that moniker? I was working with Corey Disson, who is probably the best marketing guy out there. And we were kind of hammering things out and trying to come up with a brand. And we knocked about a few things and my love of dogs and and that kind of thing. And he said, how about Top Dog? 
And I was like, eh, that sounds a little corny. How about VO Big Dog? And he was like, cool. So it just, that started it. And, you know, we developed all the, the logos and everything and, and thus all the dog and doggish references in just about everything I do. It's apropos because you do have a very vivacious and big personality as well. <laughs> so I would love to go back to your roots in radio. As I've heard it said numerous times that coming from radio into voiceover can be the kiss of death for a voice actor. And given there are so many skills one develops in radio, especially if you began at a time, which you did, when analog slide pots, reel-to-reel editing your tape by hand were the norm. (laughs) And I think that kind of training and background would be a huge benefit. Can you tell us how you became involved in radio and how that training helped or hindered your entry into voiceover? You know, and I've often often thought about, how did I end up in radio? And I try to think back and it's like, I I don't think I can point to a specific point in time. All I, I remember is I was in college at Susquehanna University, and I lucked out because they had a 5,600-watt FM station, WQSU. So it was probably one of the most powerful college radio stations on the East Coast outside of you know New York at that time. And I don't remember how I got involved, but I got involved. And me and a couple friends of mine, we kind of took over the radio station for three or four years, and we were just having a blast doing it. And, you know, I love doing it. So once I got out of college, um, I thought, okay, this is what I want to do. I'm going to go find some radio work to do and started, you know, part-time and then full-time and did a bunch here, there, and everywhere. And eventually, once got married and started raising a family, realized that radio and eating with a family don't go (laughs) hand in hand. It's just not going to work. So I put it aside for a while. I still ended up doing some part-time stuff at Magic 98.3 and CTC. It was on air, did the film review show, which was also fun. I got paid to go to the movies. How cool is that? How wonderful is that? I got paid to go to the movies. (laughs) So that that was a lot of fun. And then I put all that aside and did some various other things with my career. But it always in the back of my mind is like, I really want to get back behind the mic again at some point in some way. And I remember going to a seminar in New York that some agent was holding. And there were about 35, 40 people there. And they were talking about, you know, voiceover and gave everyone a script to read. And one by one, everyone got up in front of the class and and did your script. I got a script for Home Depot. And I think at that point, Gene Hackman was doing the voiceover work for Home Depot. So I read the script and she said, she looked at me and she goes, do that again. And I did it again. And she looked at me and said, you're in radio, aren't you? I said, yeah. She said, well, we don't want announcers. We want actors. Sit down. Oh, wow. So I was like, okay. So I guess I don't have the skills to do this. So I let that direct me and put it aside. And then around 2016, I left the corporate world because I was in the corporate world and left and was trying to figure out what I wanted to do next and got an email. And I forget who it was from, but it was about a uh, seminar, a webcast with J. Michael Collins about voiceover work. And I thought, well, what the heck? I know I've got these announcer traits Let's see if, you know, maybe I can do something with them. I don't know. So I went to the webinar, ended up contacting J. Michael after it, and we talked for a little bit, and I worked with him for a while and spent probably the first year trying to unlearn all the announcer stuff that I'd spent so many hours doing on air. So, and it's still something that I have to be conscious of, of not falling into announcer gimmicks and trying to be more authentic and conversational. And thank you for explaining that, because that's what I was wanting you to explain to our audience as to why it can be considered the kiss of death because of that whole announcer mindset. But given that you came from radio and that is what the style of radio was at the time and the style of the ads at the time, it's a really hard mindset to unlearn. It's complete retraining. It almost sounded like this woman shamed you. I mean, that's a really it ungra- felt like that. It yeah, felt it's like that, so. really ugly way to ingratiate yourself as an <laughs> a as a teacher 
And also for the other students who are probably shaking in their boots going, I'm not going to get up after that. Well, it it was interesting because there was one woman there who was, uh, um, who got up and did her thing and she kind of looked at her and said, do you have a demo reel? She said, yeah. She's like, give it to me because I've got things for you to do. So I was like, (gasps) okay, (laughs) I'm on the other end of that spectrum. But, but to put, to put it in perspective, she was right. I mean, they, they weren't looking for announcers. They needed actors. I just didn't know that. So once I got over my personal hurt feelings, it kind of struck me as like, she was absolutely right. That's what they're looking for. They're not looking for announcers. And I grew up, you know, I'm going to really age myself here. I grew up with WABC and Dan Ingram and Cousin Brucie and, you know, all those 60s announcers. So that's that's what was in my head. So having to unlearn all that and just trying to build a thick enough skin to say, okay, I don't know what I'm doing here. I need help. And that's what I had to get to and finally did with J. Michael. Yeah. And you made a very great point about needing to have a thick skin and also realizing what they needed for the marketplace wasn't announcers. And yet there are still, there's other ways as a, as a coach instructor to conduct a class. That's another point altogether. Thank right. you for explaining how you moved through that and that you reached out to a professional coach to mentor you and to help you understand that and guide you into the direction that you needed to go. And so you've gone from announcer radio to working on your skills as a voice actor and then into audiobooks, which you have quite the diversity in audio. You've gone from financial books to murder mysteries. <laughs> so <laughs> now I understand if we have a bad financier, we may want to murder them. But kind <laughs> <laughs> of walk us through how you transitioned into that. And then I want to talk to you about your own book which is really okay. interesting. So kind of guide us into your process of getting into audiobooks. <laughs> All right. Getting into audiobooks. I was, you know, I was just starting out. I was doing a lot of auditions on a lot of the pay to play sites, still focused on commercial and corporate narration and that kind of thing. And I've always I've always loved books. I'd been listening to audiobooks for years and I was just, you know, that's that's something I always enjoyed. And getting into audiobooks and you may have to edit this out later, sheer wild ass luck. I had someone reach out to me and say, hey, I've got this book. I want you to make an audio book. I know you haven't done any, but would you do it? And I looked at the book and, and we talked about it. And I said, sure, I'll do it. Knowing absolutely nothing about, <laughs> you know, and, and how you know stupid I was. You know, I was, I said, yeah, we can do it. And it was, it wasn't a long book. It was only about a two and a half hours. But I said, yeah, I can whip that out in about three, four days. Once I got into it, I was like, oh, this is not good. But I I got it in about six, seven days, not thinking about the whole editing process or anything like that. Spent a lot of sleepless nights on that one. But it was a great learning experience. And I got my feet wet with audiobooks. And once I pulled back from the craziness of it, I was like, this is kind of cool. I like doing this because even though it is a long slog and I've talked to so many VO people who are like, I can't do audiobooks. It's just, it's too much of a, of a slog, a commitment. As Scott Brick said to me once, it's so rewarding when you're done. And he's, <laughs> yeah. he's absolutely right. You know, it is, it is a very rewarding experience. So it's just kind of snowballed from there. I went through, uh, got on ACX and all the other starting sites and, you know, started auditioning for things and and got a couple more and had other people contact me outside of ACX and got a couple more and just kind of snowballed to the point where I'm right around the uh, 30 book mark that, uh, that I've done. So it's, it's, it's been good. And I, and the work just seems to keep happening. So I'm um, I'm very happy to do it. You know, would I love to do, be doing commercials and and e-learning? Yes, of course. And I still have a lot of e-learning contacts out there and corporate contacts, and I try to do some of those things as well. But the audiobook world seems to have been uh, thrown at me and has become my niche. That's a real blessing. It's kind of like on camera actors when they keep getting roles as the wonderful neighbor, or the the bit role, and they're like, oh, I just really want to be the lead actor. And yet they are a working actor. They work right. all the time. And someone else is looking at that going, take it for 
all it's worth because the fact that you are working consistently is it's a blessing. And, and that doesn't mean that you won't do all the other things that you want to do, but right now, and what a body of work that you're building up. So when I was reading this, I didn't, I didn't know this about you, that you are a member of the Audio Publishers Association. Yep. And you have self-published your own crime drama, <laughs> yes. Twisted Ties, via mm -hmm. your faceplant books. And <laughs> In your e, which is a great name, I'm sure that has many interpretations. <laughs> In your e-learning demo, you have a spot about how to properly hold drumsticks, right. and also the main protagonist in your book, Twisted Ties, is a drummer. Drummer. So I'm curious if that has anything to do with you being a drummer. When I was a kid, I was big into athletics. You know, I played baseball, I played soccer. And then uh, right around junior high school, I was having real problems with my back. And, you know, make a long story short, I couldn't do anything, any of the athletics that I was doing. They, they wanted to give my, my spine a, a break. So I didn't even take gym class all during high school and junior mm. high. So I needed something else to do. And my mother realized this, that if he doesn't have an outlet, he's just going to implode. So... um we actually went to a department store and around here that was the old EJ Corvettes, and they had a snare drum for sale. And I thought, hmm. So we bought that, and I started wailing away on that, and that just grew into my next set. And so I've been playing drums since I was 13 years old. And uh, it's, you know, it, it was a great outlet for me because I could beat the hell out of something without getting in trouble. <laughs> yeah, your mom actually got that's. She pretty understood. Proactive. She got it. She knew yeah, what that's pretty proactive on her part. But that's interesting that they just had a snare drum. They didn't even have like a, a beginner's kit. Just a, yeah, no, it was just this little red sparkly snare drum ooh, that you know, red, fell, fell off a truck somewhere and they were selling it for like $20. <laughs> yeah, you know, it was come on. But uh just it just grew from there and I've I've always loved playing the drums. So what kind of music is in your wheelhouse and are you still practicing your paradiddles? <laughs> you know, it's funny you say that because I actually was, I have a drum pad up and I was actually doing some paradiddles earlier. Music in my wheelhouse is just about anything you can think of. Music is just part of my soul and it doesn't matter whether it's classical, which I get from my grandfather, just a love of classical music, mm -hmm. jazz, blues, rock, progressive rock, some country, not a lot. Um, but just about anything else. I mean, I, I love music and, and I love playing it and I love listening to it. And it's unusual that a day goes by that I'm not listening to something. Yeah. And it, and it probably helps you a lot in your voice work because it's very rhythmic. And I think musicians tend to be not better, but, you know, they, they kind of get the rhythm of a sentence or a paragraph or a story. And I imagine that would help you in your audiobook narration as well. Yeah, it it does. It, it gives you that innate sense of rhythm and and timing, and it's you know. And I sit when I sit down the drums, I feel the same thing. It's like you know, because people talk to me, and it's like, well, how do you get your all your arms and legs to do different things? And I was like, <laughs> I don't even think about it. I don't even think about it. I'm I'm in the middle of the song, and I just feel the song, and this is the way it's going to be, and you you run with it. What blows my mind are the, the drummers who can also sing. You think of the Phil Collins, you think, I mean, we could go on down the line of the drummers right. who sing, but it's such a coordination in the first place. But it's practice, 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 right? I, I guess. Fortunately, uh, I don't have that problem because <laughs> bands have asked me to sing. I was like, you don't really want me to sing. You really don't want me to sing. So. <laughs> Oh my gosh, do you still have the red sparkly snare drum? No, no, that's that's long gone. I now have a uh, a green wood grain uh Yamaha kit. Ooh. That uh yeah, it's a good looking kit. I mean, I fell in love with it when I saw it and uh it's a good looking kit. I like it a lot. Yeah, Yamahas are gorgeous sounding drums. I'm gonna that... say you're you're related to a drummer. I'm related to a drummer. Yeah, he he actually is awaiting his uh, shipment of a custom drum kit that he ordered that is going to be shipped on the barge one of these years. So Would it's, he it's buy just, a DW kit? Uh, you would think after going through the journey with him, oh my, no, it's not a DW. <laughs> Oh dear goodness! I you know I'll, I'll I'm sorry I didn't mean later. to put you on the spot. No, it's okay. <laughs> it's just it's just getting older, Jim. The I names. understand. 
I understand. Right. Okay. Yeah. If it's not, I have my name in my tags in my shirts now. I want to make sure, and my address, I want to make sure I can get home. I can remember my first (laughs) phone number 55, 60 years ago, but don't ask me what I had for lunch today. Me too. Right after my head. Me too. Yes. 838-0681 from when I was five years old. (laughs) 233-2023. And I'm old enough that I remember it was Adam V-E. 3. Yes, or our, <laughs> over here it was V-E. Yes, yeah. exactly. Oh, my gosh. All the all the youngins, if, if, they, if there's any youngins <laughs> listening by now, are going to go, what the heck are they talking about? I'm not even going to bring up the fact that my grandfather, who was an engineer for then Western Electric, which became AT&T, was on the original engineering team that made the conversion from crank to dial. Really? Yeah. That is so cool. Well, the, it, now you obviously grew up on the East Coast. Yes. Right. Yes. Okay. Well, being on the West Coast out here, it was General Telephone, which went on to become Verizon. Right. And my mom worked for General Telephone for a while. And when I mentioned, you know, I've been, you know, I was with Verizon. I'm no longer now, but I would say I've been with them since they were General Telephone. And people look at you like, what the heck are you talking about? It's like, oh, never mind. It's, That's interesting because I worked for about 13 years for Verizon. Oh, you did? Yeah, yeah, on the uh, wireless side in on the East Coast. What did you do for them? I was a IT project manager. Worked with the teams that did all the in-store software that the uh, retail people used and the billing system and all that other stuff. Jim, in your bio, you mentioned that for the past five years, you have been a caregiver to caregiver volunteers for Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center mm-hmm. because you've experienced the same process over the past couple of years. And I'm curious if you wouldn't mind sharing, what does that mean for you? In 2014, my wife was diagnosed with brain cancer, which came out of the blue to both of us and just, you know... As, as anyone will tell you who's been through it, when you hear that diagnosis, you have cancer, your world immediately changes and, yeah. and becomes something so that sorry. you never even imagined. She's fine, by the way. She's been clear for six years. So oh, it's, wonderful. It's cool. But we both went through a lot getting to the diagnosis. And then once we got the diagnosis, she was treated at Sloan Kettering in New York and got such an amazing level of care from the nurses, the doctors food service people, everybody there was just as good as you can get. I mean, we feel so lucky and so blessed to have had that experience there with them because it was we couldn't have asked for anything better. But going through that, it was at a time when the industry was really just starting to pay attention to caregivers and realizing that the stress and pressure that caregivers were experiencing was the same or similar to that that the patients were were experiencing. Yeah. And there weren't a lot of resources available at that time for caregivers. This is 2014, 2015. So once once we got on the the, the back end of, of treatment and things had gone well, I said to the neurologist who was working with my wife, I said, I really want to give back to you guys and not necessarily in a monetary way, but just because our experience has been so good. And he talked about a volunteer organization that was just starting within Sloan Kettering. So I got in touch with the, the the woman, Wendy Benia, who was heading up the volunteer process, and they were just starting the caregiver to caregiver process. They had a patient to patient process where patients could call other patients who'd been through it. It's kind of a support kind of thing. So they had just started that with caregivers. And I, so I kind of got in on the ground floor and what it ends up being is that uh, other people that are going through it, other caregivers that are going through it can can reach out to internally at Sloan and they'll hook them up with me and we'll sit on the phone and I'll talk to them. I'll listen to them because that's really it's what it's all about. It's more listening to them than talking to them and hear what they're going through and, and relate as well as I can with my own experiences and let them know that they're feeling the right things, they're experiencing the right things and you know, that kind of thing. So it's, it's, it's a real gift to me to be able to do that with so many people and reach out and, and try to help so many people that are experiencing this process. What an expression of gratitude also on your part to want to give back like that, because 
anyone haven't gone through that, and I, I've gone through that with my own family members, it is so necessary. And like you said, most people don't think of caregivers till that time. Right. And and especially now with the COVID numbers in our country, right. doctors and nurses and caregivers are going to need more and more and more of that because they're re- it's kind of like being on the front lines of, of war. You're seeing things that most people don't see in a lifetime. And now all of a sudden, in addition to COVID, there are still cancer patients and heart patients and other patients who are needing attention. So thank you for sharing that. I'm so happy to hear that your wife is doing yeah. better and on yeah, the other doing, side of that. She's doing great. And, you know, the the other thing about that is that I, I just was repeatedly shocked by everything that I didn't know about cancer and about caregiving. And I was just, we were constantly walking around the hospital because our treatments were, were every other week for about five months and we had to be in there for like three or four days. So we would walk around the corridors and just feel so grateful knowing that our situation that we were in could be infinitely worse than mm-hmm. it was because so many people were there for their second, third, fourth time, whatever it happened to be. So it's it, it, was, it really kind of opened my eyes for the need for this kind of thing. And there was one other person there, and I won't go through the whole story, um, but she and I kind of hooked up and she was there from Switzerland, had left her family to be there to support her mother. And she and I kind of got to talking and there was one day I was walking down the corridor and she was leaning up against the wall with her head down. And I knew what that look was. Mm. It was, she was just enough. And I walked up to her and she kind of looked at me and I gave her a hug and, you know, she burst out in tears and we talked about it. And, you know, she was feeling the guilt. She was feeling the pressure. I'm like, this is not easy stuff. So the other side of that coin, and I know we haven't talked about this yet, was, okay, what else can I do here? And well, what else I did was write my second book. And it's a nonfiction caregiver survival manual with all the tips that I learned and using me and my wife's story behind it as kind of backup. So it's kind of a humorous but serious look at, hey, if you need some help with caregiving, Here's something, here's a resource you can use. So I'm, in, I'm done writing it. It's in the process of, of being published. I don't know when it's going to be out, but it's done and it's out there. And I'm hoping that I can get it out there and it'll be of some help to somebody. I would imagine it would be a, a tremendous help because those are the resources and tools that people need. And it obviously came out of very personal experience. So you have firsthand knowledge of how to speak to the need that you know, you mentioned it perfectly. Until you go through something, how on earth would you know? Mm. You know, it's like we hear of open heart surgery all the time. How on earth would anyone know how involved the recovery is on that until you've walked through something, whether it's surgery or cancer or fill in the blank, how would you know? So how beautiful that you came up with this resource, rather, because I would imagine during that time you were facing a huge amount of fear. And so I'm curious, was this a tool that you were working at just kind of writing down your thoughts at the time or were there other tools or did you have a particular faith that pulled you through this time? There is, on the day that we got the diagnosis um, and the doctor turned to us and said, you know, it's lymphoma. I don't think I had ever felt a fear like that before in my life. And I've got some definite fears. You know, I hate flying. You know, I used to be afraid of bats, you know, that kind of stuff. But this was a level that I had just never experienced before. I mean, I just, you know, if you had hit me in the head with a ball peen hammer, it probably wouldn't have been any different, mm. you know. And so it was that level of fear. And it's it's and it stays with you until you get into the process of treatment. And then it really subsides because now you've got answers, now you've got a plan, and and it's a little bit of a respite. But on the first night of her first treatment, which was Thanksgiving week, 2014, and what a treat that is to be in the hospital Thanksgiving um, for treatment, I was lying there looking at the ceiling going, I need to write about this somehow. And so I started making fo- um, started making posts on Facebook. And I called them fringe observations because I felt like I was like on the fringe, on the mm-hmm. edges, observing what was going on. And it and it served a couple purposes. One, it gave me an outlet to to write about it. Two, 
it kept all the family people and friends informed of what was going on. I didn't have to make 85 phone calls every day. Which is exhausting, too. Which is exhausting in and of itself. So, you know, I I started doing, you know, the posts every day and, and talking about it. And the thing that just blew me away, and Sally, my wife, it blew her away, too. From that very first post, people from our high school class of 74, that's how far, came out of the woodwork and were, were leaving comments. And, and, you know, every post I did, there'd be 200, 200 likes or 200 <laughs> comments. Wow. And, you know, it was just like we felt so blessed. And, you know, to have all this, you know, Sally would look at the, at the phone with all the comments with, you know, tears running down her face going, where, what, why me? Why, wh- how do they, you know, who am I? You know, and it's just like, you don't understand the impact you have on people. So those posts kind of were the impetus to make the book. Isn't that the beauty of social media when it's used as properly. Yeah. yeah, used properly. Because prior to that, how would she have ever known other than people either calling or coming by or sending cards, but to right. have that immediate dose of encouragement during what was the most difficult time for her and right. for you. So and and it started because of what you were doing. Thank you for sharing that very intimate story and how that's turning into, I know this is not why you did it, but it may be something that you can also narrate from a oh, very- Oh, I already have. I oh, already you have. have? Okay. Yeah, okay. I've already <laughs> recorded it. I've already okay. recorded it. <laughs> yeah, and I, and what better person to do it? Because it, it's well, definitely hard. that's what I figured. Hard. Yeah, exactly. I figured, who else is going to do this? I can do it better. And I think you've just answered this next question, but I'll ask you anyway, because it may be something in addition to what you just shared. But if you had to pick one of your greatest achievements, professionally or otherwise, what would it be? Wow. Um, For me, and I'm going to give you two answers. For me, personally, was getting that first book published, because that was a a long-term goal of mine. And I didn't care whether it sold or not. My goal was to have it published. Hmm. The other side of that coin, if I if I broaden the scope of it a little bit, <laughs> I kind of feel like George Bailey. It's all the connections I have with friends and family and having, you know, a marriage of 40 some odd years and having two wonderful kids and three grandkids and, you know, and all the people that are either in my life currently or have passed through my life at, at one point or another that uh, I've been blessed to be a part of, that to me is means more than anything else. What better time for that to have a more poignant meaning? I mean, that's beautiful because I think this past year and a half has hopefully taught us that it's not the things, it's the people. That's the other thing about you know the, the cancer experience Boy, does that change your perspective really quick. Yes, absolutely. You know, I'd I'd look look at, you know, the the nurses would come in to give her treatments and they'd then, thank God, they'd explain what all the different drugs are doing. And, you know, you look up some of the drugs and it's like, well, this affects the fourth nitrogen molecule strain of this. (laughs) And I'm like, I'm concerned about whether a computer program is going to run properly to sell a $10 case for a phone. I don't think so. <laughs> it, so re- yes, it really does crystallize what's important. And then, absolutely, you know, conversely, going out into, quote, the real world and hearing what people are griping about. And you just want to look at them and go, you know what? Doesn't it's, matter. It's so trivial. Conversely, do you have a less than successful time that informed you of the next right step to take? <laughs> oh, how long are we going to be doing this? I mean, <laughs> it's your show, darling. Take all the time you want. God. I'll just stop recording at the fifth hour. Oh, <laughs> uh, wow. You know, I've been blessed and and most people would say, no, you haven't. Come on. But I've, I've been blessed to have made so many mistakes in my life that, and been able to learn from them that, uh, you know, I don't, I don't know if I could, I, could, I could pick one unless we wanted to turn this into a <clears throat> group therapy session, in which case we'd be here for a while. But um, I have to say that 
When I was working in radio in central Pennsylvania, and we had just had our second child, and I was actually had left radio and ended up working at a uh, photography store and studio for a while. And Sally had uh, quit work and was home taking care of the kids, and it's, money just wasn't working. You know, we couldn't pay our bills. We couldn't pay anything. And I ended up going to work for my dad, who was in real estate at the time, back in New Jersey. And it took me years to realize that this was a solution to a problem. You know, this this is what needed to be done because of the choices that both she and I had made. Now, having said that, <laughs> that... Seven years that I worked with my dad probably did more psychic damage to me than, than anything else I can, I can imagine in my life. But, mm. you know, it's coming out the other side of that, you know, pushed me into a lot of things that I needed to be pushed into to deal with a lot of crap from the past. And, you know, thankfully I did it and, and got with the right people and, you know, on the other side of that, even though it was a long struggle and it was hard work, the other side of that is just so much more freeing that, you know, I certainly want, wouldn't want to do it again, but did it have its good outcome? Yeah, absolutely. When we go through things like that, they usually do. If we pay attention to the lessons and what it is we're supposed to grasp while we're going through it. And it obviously did. You obviously came out the other side right. and have an appreciation for what that time meant in your life. So, Jim, what makes you hopeful? Hmm. My grandkids make me hopeful. You know, I've got uh, 12-year-old twin girls and a three-year-old girl that are just unreal. Uh, the three-year-olds, you know, three going on 25. And, <laughs> yes. You know, the twins are turning 13, so that's going to be experience as, as well. But, you know, seeing their sense of play and optimism and joy in the midst of a lot of the chaos that their lives have gone through personally, as well as, you know, all the other global chaos that's going on with, you know, the pandemic and, yeah you know, wars and everything else. You know, I, I look at them and in one breath, I get angry that we're giving them this world that we're giving them. On the other hand, I look at them and say, you know what? You guys may come up with a solution that, you know, my generation, you know, didn't come up with. And, you know, maybe there's there's hope in that going down the road. And maybe they'll be more aware of some of the things that need to be tackled, particularly in this country. And, you know, maybe they can they can push those movements along and push those actions along where we have failed to do that for so many years. So that gives that gives me a sense of of hope for the future. And I just hope we don't screw things up to the point where they can't fix it. I really lovely answered because I, I agree with you. I think there is a lot of hope in, in children. And conversely, would you say that also brings you joy in your life? Right, right. If there was a soundtrack to your life, Jim, what would be on it and why? I'm supposed to be asking these questions, not you. Um <laughs> Okay, like, Cheryl, if there was this no, project, Now I know what my guests go through <laughs> when I spring these things on them. If there was a soundtrack to my life, there would be two different pieces of music that would alternate. One would be Quadrophenia by The Who. Oh. Because there's because it came out in a very formative time in my life in high school when I was working in a record store, which was my dream job, and they were big at the time, and this had a lot of thing about teenage angst in it, and mm -hmm. I really related to it. And even to this day, I can, you know, there's one particular track, uh, Bellboy, that I kind of have as my song, and it's like, so that that means a lot to me. The other piece of music is a tone poem by Richard Strauss called Ein Heldenleben, which is a wonderful piece of music, but it's just, and Ein Heldenleben means a hero's life. And it's, it's just, the music is just so well orchestrated and conducted and it. I can't tell you why, but it just really, really reaches me. And that is like my, my go-to piece of classical music to get me going. Which is a very eclectic range of what you just gave. <laughs> I love that. We, we won't get into the things like 
Green Day and Bad Religion and Dream Theater and the punk and the prog and, and that kind of thing, which is also part of that whole wheelhouse. So we'll, we'll let that go. One of the things I realized, I mean, I mentioned it in your introduction, but I was remiss in asking you about the hydrant. And this is going to lead into my final question for you. But I would love to for you to speak about the hydrant and how that came to be for you, because you you just mentioned these are, you know, you're used to asking the questions and now you know how your guests feel. <laughs> Please tell the listeners about the hydrant, where they can listen to it and when it comes out. Okay. Uh it came about because Corey Disson and I were batting around some ideas of some content, and I just didn't want to do the same old thing that everyone else was doing. I mean, everyone has, you know, this and that, that's their particular niche in life, and I wanted to do something different. And I always was a fan of James Lipton's Inside the Actor Studio and, and the questions that he would put to his guests, because some of them, not all of them, but some of them were geared toward really finding out who they are, you know, outside of the the profession that they're in. Mm -hmm. So we thought, okay, well, let's do, a, let's do a little quick little thing like that. And I said, okay, wh what are we going to call this thing? And I was thinking, well, there's the view, there's the talk, there's the kitchen. Uh, and then Corey said, how about the hydrant? <laughs> with the dog, with the mm -hmm. big dog thing. And there's all sorts of gross innuendos we can make about, you know, get a leg up at the hydrant and, you know, that, that kind of thing. So it was, um, I was like, yeah, that'll work. That'll work. And so I just started putting it together. I invited some people to, to do, and, and fortunately everyone was like on board with it, supporting me with it. And the very first guest was Bev Standing and then went into Jen Henry and Patrick Kirshner. And it's, it's been great. And each episode comes out uh, every Monday morning at 10 a.m. I post it on all my social media platforms, the big four, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and LinkedIn. It's also on my website, jimcoopervo.com. And it's, just, it's their little 10-minute uh, snippets of me asking them bizarre questions, you know, like, what's your favorite curse word? If you were an ice cream flavor, what would you be? And, and people look at me like, ah, he's out of his mind. And then we'll usually wrap up with, I ask people, you know, what's, what's a good piece of advice you would give to someone coming in the VO business for the first time? So it's available every week. You can look at all the episodes on my website, uh, again, jimcoopervo.com, and you can do backslash the dash hydrant. And it'll take you to the page that has all the, the episodes on it. And it's been great. People have just been so funny and, and so open to just talking about things, you know, much like we're doing here, where it's, 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 it's something different. And uh, I, I enjoy doing it. And I get to know so many different people, and I get to know so much about them. Yeah, I wouldn't it otherwise know. I, you know. When would I ever have a chance to sit down and talk with – you know, Scott Brick one on one or, you know, Bob Bergen one on one. You know, it's just it's it's just offered me a wealth of contacts and friendships that I don't think I would have made any other way. And for the listeners who aren't familiar with those names, those are some really prominent personalities in the voiceover business that you would know their characters and or voice, but may not know them by name. And that's why this is a fantastic outlet to not only hear them, but to see them. And as you mentioned, hear things that you wouldn't normally hear about them. Right. So thank you very much for, for talking about that. And you mentioned your website. Are there any, I will definitely have it in the show notes. Are there any other social media handles that you want to give out? Yeah, everything is Jim Cooper VO on all social media except for Instagram. And it's a long story why that, that is what it is. But on Instagram, it's your VO big dog. Well, that makes perfect sense. I, I tried to keep it within, <laughs> within reasons. So. <laughs> That's kind of smart, Jim. So, I thank you so much, VO oh, big thank you dog. For for having me. This was this was fun. I love doing this. And um, like I said, I'm, I'm so grateful and honored that uh, you invited me to be on here. It's cool to be on this end of the conversation for a change. 
I am very, very grateful that you joined me, especially in the midst of doing an audio book, because that is such a long and laborious process that <laughs> to come up for air to it and spend an hour with me, I'm very honored. And I wish you 46 years more of beautiful, <laughs> healthy marriage to your beautiful bride, Sally. And so happy to hear the good outcome on the other side of, of such a... Mm such a heart-wrenching story that you shared, and yet there is a lot of beauty. I mean, number one, that she came through it, but that you have a resource for other caregivers and a book that you've now narrated, and I wish you a lot of luck on that. Thank you. You're Thank very you. welcome, Jim. And is there anything else you'd like to share before we say goodbye? <sighs> No. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Which Alrighty is the worst, then. the worst answer I could possibly give. But but, but no, I I feel pretty good about what we've done. And, <laughs> okay. and everybody just stay safe and say, stay healthy and use your head for crying out loud. Amen. Or we're going to send the big dog your way. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you again, Jim. I appreciate it. Thanks, Cheryl. Appreciate it. You're welcome. I'd also like to thank the following news outlets for the use of their clips in so aptly painting the picture of the fear that we're facing during this pandemic. BBC, PBS, Now This, UNESCO, and Some Good News. I especially want to thank Joel and Luke Smallbone, otherwise known as the group for King and Country, for allowing me to use an excerpt of their song, Together, which could not be a more hopeful and inspiring song for such a time as this. Finally, I'll leave you with the following from Proverbs 23:18. Surely there is a future, and your hope will not be cut off. Thank you again for joining me today. Feel free to offer feedback or a story idea at 19stories at soundsatchelstudios.com. Visit my website at soundsatchelstudios.com. Via Instagram at Cheryl Holling VO. I look forward to sharing more stories on the next episode of 19 Stories from Fear to Hope. Until then, stay healthy and hopeful. Together with our differences, together we are bolder, braver, stronger.